<laughs> if there's popular demand. Can we upvote that in the Q and A? I think if somebody submits a Q and A, yeah, we can we can check if it is popular. We should set like a, a <laughs> there it is minimum amount. If, if we get twenty <laughs> votes, then then we get the puppy. So everyone better engage. <laughs> okay, twenty votes. You heard it all, attendees. Wow, we're already at seven. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. All right, maybe I'll save some time at the end of this presentation to quickly bring her in. <clears throat> wow, that was very quick. We're almost to 20 already. Are we already? Oh, oh wow. Like, we're see. at 19. <laughs> and there's 20. Well, there we I go. I guess you have been forced now. All right. Um, <laughs> so with that, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Oliver Schneider from the University of Waterloo, who's going to be giving a talk about how to design haptic experiences. If you wouldn't mind taking it away. All right, thank you, Zane. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about how to design haptic experiences. And I'm specifically going to talk about how we can apply interaction design principles to haptics. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo. And my research sits at the intersection of two different fields, haptics and HCI, human computer interaction. I call my agenda, uh, my research agenda, haptic computing, because I'm really trying to create a uh, an infrastructure so that everyone uh, could work with haptics in a way that's really easy and rapid so that we can all work with touch the same way we might work with uh, video, audio, or other kinds of media uh, uh, so easily that the way that we do it really easily right now. If you want to check out more, you can come to the, the lab website. Um, but I want to start by showing this definition of human computer interaction. So this was uh, one definition for this is by ACM SIGCHI uh, from 1992 which defines it as a discipline concerned with the design, implementation, and evaluation of interactive computing systems. And if you take this definition and you look at it, you see there's three different activities, design, implement, evaluate. And these form an iterative cycle, something that you do you know, rapidly. You design some ideas, you come up with a bunch of them, you try them out, you then evaluate them with the people who might use your system, uh, and then you do this over and over again to arrive at the right solution. And in my class, so I'm teaching a class on HCI right now. So this diagram is in my head a lot. This is a more elaborate diagram of this process. And so what I'd like to do today is go through each of these activities and explain what I know about accomplishing this with haptic technology. A lot of this is fairly new. So I'll be drawing a lot from my own work as well as work from uh, a lot of people in the community, uh, including some of the people on this panel. Um, so let's get started. Before we begin though, uh, I'd like to start with a couple of definitions. So during my PhD, I analyzed interviews with haptics experts and I developed a couple of different definitions for some terms that you may have already heard. One is haptician. We've already heard Matteo use that earlier in the, the session. And we've defined this as one who is skilled at making haptic sensations, technology or experiences. And the reason I raise this definition is to show that there's a real diversity in the people who work with haptics. You might be a psychologist interested in, in studying the sense of touch. You might be an engineer developing new technology, or you might be a designer or developer who's interested in creating an experience. Uh, I'll be talking more about that latter camp, but it really shows the diversity of the people who work in haptic experience design and also the diversity of the different people that are on this panel and in this session. And haptic experience design, uh, I define this as the design, planning, development, and evaluation. Again, we see those different activities with slightly different names of user experiences deliberately connecting interactive technology to one more perceived sense of touch, probably in a multi-sensory experience. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but the, the trick here is that we're talking about interactive technology, senses of touch, but it, um, it is often multi-sensory. And I, I quote, perceived sense of touch. So it could be, you know, visual illusions that make you think that something's happening when it's not. So it really is this very broad, difficult, multi-sensory design problem. So let's start into these different activities. And we're gonna start with establishing requirements. So when I'm teaching my class, one of the things I teach my students is the first thing you do is you go and talk to the people and you understand their needs. The problem when you're working with haptics is when hapticians talk to people, there are major barriers to communication. So again, drawing from those interviews with haptics experts that I mentioned earlier, you get quotes from hapticians saying, people don't really know what to do with haptics. 
sure, it's uh, it's probably going to add to the user experience and it's going to be a standard feature in the future. But right now, there is this real barrier for people who, if you're designing for a certain population or you're designing for people like end users who might use a system, it's really difficult to understand what their needs are because they might walk into the lab and say, hey, I want you to build a design that feels variable. Normally, I'd ask everyone to raise their hand if you know what variable means. Uh, I wouldn't raise my hand because I don't know. I'm going to assume, because I can't see you, that you don't know either. Um, the client doesn't know how to describe their needs. The haptician doesn't know what to make of it. And so what they end up doing is they uh, go into the, the hardware lab and just rapidly play around with all of the different haptic devices and experiences that the haptician has on hand until they arrive at something that they understand to be something that the client would want. And it really takes that tight iteration to establish what the client is going for. So it's really, really challenging to establish these ground rules. So when you're talking to people, you have to be prepared to show examples of haptics and work to establish a shared vocabulary of their needs and goals. And once you understand a bit of what the person that you're talking to needs, the next thing you can do is start to establish your goals. So typically in interaction design, uh, goals are split into pragmatic and hedonic concerns. And you might think of this as usefulness. So it has utility for the person that's using it and it's usable. It means that you're not gonna run into, you know, you can actually use the thing. And then experiential goals, these are the hedonic concerns. So it feels good. Uh, and this can actually have an impact on how well something operates. And certainly how well people use it. So some examples of these in typical systems for pragmatic concerns is it's effective, efficient, safe. It's easy to learn and easy to remember how to use. And if you think about experiential concerns, it might be enjoyable, engaging, aesthetically pleasing, and if negatively, it might be boring, annoying, or frustrating. And you can think to interfaces that you've used in the past that are frustrating, you just don't want to use them, and then you won't, and it won't be a good experience, and people won't engage with the system. With haptics, there are a few specific goals you might have. So you could consider a lot of these ideas, uh, but I've been thinking a lot about what people might want to achieve with their systems. And this year at Kai, which is the flagship HCI conference, uh, we presented a model called the HX model, the haptic experience model, which splits up these concerns into pragmatic and hedonic concerns like you would with a UX model. This was also derived from uh, interviews with uh, haptics experts as well as haptic novices. And we came up with a proposal that these are some of the most important concerns you might wanna consider when developing a haptic system. When pragmatic concerns, you wanna make sure it has utility. Obviously, you wanna make sure it's useful and feels useful for someone. But you also wanna consider things like consistency, causality, and saliency. You know, are people noticing the haptics, but not too much that it's intrusive? That's saliency. Is it causal? Do you know where the haptics is coming from? And can you understand what it means when it's happening? And consistency is, uh, you know, making sure that it actually works uh, within the environment as well as with others. So you kind of divine, design in sets, make sure that you work with everything together. And with hedonic uh, goals, you have, we came up with five different factors, harmony, autotelics, realism, immersion, and expressivity. Harmony is typically the most important, and it means that you have all the senses work together. As you'll hear a lot today, uh, the sense of touch is tightly related to sense of vision and audio. Um, and so you wanna make sure that there's nothing that disrupts that. But for developing a good experience, you really wanna make sure that there's kind of the sense of harmony that is achieved when you have everything just working at the right time, it just feels right. And that combines to be the sense of harmony, which can be a goal in and of itself and can create a good experience. Autotelics means uh, it feels good in and of itself. So it's the kind of thing where, so I have, um, I'm a big camper and uh, an outdoors person and I have a Yeti mug and I'm not plugging them, I'm not sponsored or anything. And it just feels good to hold, you know, this mug here feels good to hold. And that's sort of this just, you know, if you ever find yourself kind of like just touching like a fabric, like some silk and it's like, oh yeah, that feels good. That's autotelics. Realism and immersion are very important for uh, virtual reality and sometimes mixed reality systems. So these are ones that you're probably already aware of, um, but you may not be aware, you may not need them in all cases. So if you're developing a low attention wearable, you may not want it to be terribly immersive. So you can kind of pick and choose these goals. Now expressivity means you want to have like a high bandwidth. If it can only display a two or three buzzes or two or three types of uh, sensations, it's not going to be as engaging as something that can be really expressive. So in the interest of time, uh, we can kind of walk through, I'm not going to walk through the full HX model. So I'll take 
suggest that you take a look at the paper, but there is more detail in the paper to talk about this, including personalization, which is really, really critical to make sure that these experiences fit everyone. So that's establishing requirements and, and your goals. You wanna bridge communication barriers to talk to people and you wanna define your goals, both pragmatic and hedonic. And thinking about it in this way can help you really frame what you're trying to do. Once you have your goals and you know what you wanna to try to achieve, then you start to design alternatives. So let's go look at this. I wanna caution you not to leap into building something. Anyone with, uh, with, if you have design training, you know that it makes sense to kind of think about what you're trying to do. It can be very valuable to explore the capabilities of different devices and materials. So there is value in just kind of messing around with the haptics and getting a sense of what's going on, but it's also valuable to explicitly think about the interaction design of your system. And one of the best ways to start doing this is to collect examples. Going back to these interviews with hapticians, Hapticians talked about how they would collect physical push buttons just to get in contact with all the diversity of stuff. And I know lots of engineers and lots of hapticians that have these giant collections of just junk, of things that kind of are kind of cool and they feel good or just examples that they can kind of grab and play with. And so you have this giant repertoire of things that you are aware of that helps you know uh, that you can then grab and use in your systems when you design them. And there are you know, other ways of capturing this um, at companies that involve haptics, they often have guideline books that talk about the design of the physical widgets. So things like sliders, physical sliders, uh, push buttons, all of this is documented. And so you have, uh, you know, descriptions of these kinds of objects that you might find in your, you know, your company or your institution, or you can find elsewhere. So there is reference material for some of this that you can use. And the nice thing you have at this time of getting into haptics is there are several systems that are available to help you collect examples for HX design. I'm going to talk about some research examples, but many of the uh, lots of companies have um, libraries of effects you can also draw upon. Haptopedia is one tool uh, developed by Hasi Safi and her collaborators, and it's a collection of devices, specifically grounded force feedback devices. And so, if you're interested in force feedback, you might take a look at this system. It's online. You can you know browse it right now, and it's you know got all these devices you can see their workspaces you can see their history and the different uh, papers that they're involved with and also what kind of ap applications they might be good for and so it might give you a sense of you know what devices might be useful for what you're trying to achieve another tool uh, also spearheaded by Hasti Safi uh, is a collection of vibrations into different facets or complementary views this is called ViveViz. I'm going to show you a little video uh, it doesn't have audio so hopefully it's playing for you and you can kind of filter along, you know, either sensory and emotional views, or you can take a look at something that's really long in duration. So it really allows you to frame it how you want and explore. And so if you work with examples, you might want to uh, take a look at these different facets. Uh, I also want to highlight the Pen Haptic Texture Toolkit, which has been around for a little bit. Uh, this is a collection of 100 or more um, uh, different textures that you can involve in your systems. This is by Heather Culbertson, uh, who I believe will be speaking later today. Uh, and so this is a, also a nice resource for you to be able to look at if you want to have sort of a realistic texture. And a cool project that came out of uh, WIST the other, I think two years ago, uh, was one button to rule them all. I think this video will play. And it's, um, it's a open source system to be able to, to do different arbitrary buttons, but it also has a set of examples. You can kind of take them and then maybe modify them. So if you're building some sort of a system that has a button and you want to kind of re recreate that, you can look at this to give some examples. There are lots of more of these systems. I'm just highlighting some of the ones that might be good starting places for you. If you can, you wanna try and find visible modifiable examples because this will help you learn with, to work with the medium and give you a starting point for your design. So one study I did back uh, a couple of years ago uh, used this online tool called Macaron. And the way this tool works is it's, it's an online um, interface for editing vibrotactile systems. Uh, it's not as good as the commercial systems that are available right now, uh, but you can go online and use it if you want. And you can kind of edit on the left and you have these examples on the right. But what we did is we use this, so you have an editor, you have a set of examples, and then you can just view the different examples and kind of view the source of them. And we use this to study how the different, uh, how portraying examples might influence your design process. We recorded a set of interaction logs to be able to understand uh, how people would work with this. This is you know, a fairly complex visualization, but what you need to know is like green is when you hit the space bar to play through the entire design. Um, orange is when you're editing, red is when you're scrubbing around. And so if you're trained, you can kind of read this, but I'll walk you through this. 
when people have examples, they typically go through and click on them uh, to kind of see what's out there, get a sense of like all the different ideas you might have. This is again, that kind of preparation gathering step when designing alternatives. And here you, um, you actually can't copy and paste, uh, you, but you can view the examples. And what people did is they would look at these different examples and they'd find the thing closest to what they wanted to create. Here, they're trying to create a heartbeat and they've arrived at this sensation. And then they move into a different phase, initial design. Here is where they, um, if they could copy and paste, they would just copy and paste the, the uh, system. Or if it was uh, visible but not editable, they would actually physically recreate it before creating something new. So grabbing examples to start with is really a natural way to, to begin your process. We're gonna come back to this interface later on to talk about how you would actually edit things. Uh, but this gives you a sense of how important examples are. And if you can grab them uh, in a way that you can view the source, then you can start to learn how to do how to work with a different medium uh, media of that example um, more easily. So because people use them directly as a starting point, so having a template really gets you started. Um, but you could also, you know, learn by taking a look at how things those kind of shapes. You know, it gives me a general idea of thinking big shapes rather than little dots. Someone who's new to haptics can see that and say, ah, oh, we really have to have these big changes in amplitude for it to be a good design. I'm going to start doing that. Collecting examples will help inform what's possible and help you get started with existing materials. But working with the devices is not just enough. You also want to think about the conceptual design of your system. So in my course, I talk about conceptual design, which can be a tricky concept. Um, an outline, uh, so conceptual design is an outline of what people can do with a product and what concepts are needed to understand or how to interact with it. So for example, with a voice agent, you might have a physical thing called an echo that allows you to communicate with an agent called Alexa using your voice. The echo has a volume value that can be changed. And you can contrast this with concrete design, which is your concrete detail. So this would be, you know, for this echo, you have two volume buttons, you get Alexa, Alexa's attention by saying Alexa, there's a divine set of tasks that Alexa knows how to do. And so uh, by thinking about these different concepts, the fact that there is an agent that you are talking to them, that there is an echo, uh, like a physical object that's different from the agent, this really helps you think through your design. This matters because you can structure your design in many different ways. I'm going to, um, because let's say you're building a website, you can think about whether the site is a linked set of linked pages or actually a hierarchy. So it can really change how people interact with the design. I'll skip through these examples and I'm going to instead move on to um, how you might do this with haptics. So to do this, you might want to come up with a conceptual model, you know, thinking about the metaphors and analogies that are employed in the design, the concepts that it exposes. These are often the data model that's hidden behind the system and the relationships between them, including mapping. So like the volume buttons map to the volume. With haptics, we've looked at this with how hap novice hapticians um, would interact with systems. So we recruited a set of student teams to develop a learning environment for a STEM topic using one or more haptic devices, and we studied their process. They worked with two uh, open source, open hardware uh, learning devices. So we've got the HapKit from Stanford and Haply um, devices. And what we did is we uh, distributed these in a, a student innovation challenge for World Haptics uh, a couple of years ago. We drew from a variety of data sources over the course of the student innovation challenge. So we deployed this, we sent it out, we talked to the students, deployed surveys, and we also talked to the judges to understand their process. And we did a qualitative analysis to understand what people did with these tools. What we discovered is that they followed this really messy pro process and really didn't have a good sense of how to follow the design process um, and didn't think through the conceptual design. The offices were overwhelmed with the technology. You know, they're often focused on just debugging or getting their systems to work rather than important design processes like conceptual design, iteration, file communication. And while experts were deliberate about their process, novices might need guidance through these activities. So if you're starting to work with haptics, it's, as you will see more and more today, there's a lot to think about with when it comes to perception, when it comes to the hardware, et cetera, with the software. And so you wanna make sure you set aside time to really think through what you're trying to achieve um, and think about these processes. And then, you know, go and debug everything. So when it comes to designing alternatives, the advice I have for you is to gather examples of designs, devices, materials, anything you can, and think through a conceptual design. Make sure you set aside the time to think through what you want to accomplish and how you might accomplish it. Moving on to prototyping. 
When prototyping, you might want to start by generating lots of ideas by elaborating to create a wide search space. You want to make sure you're considering as much ideas as possible. So you start by elaborating through brainstorming. And then you narrow in on the most promising ideas. You then reduce. Combining these two is what's known as Lasso's funnel. So you generate lots of ideas, you reduce them to come up with the most uh, interesting ideas, and then you iteratively do this to come up with a final solution. And how you accomplish this is you go from cheap, fast, low fidelity prototypes to more involved high fidelity prototypes. Fidelity is the amount of functionality and performance rel relative to the final product. And so if you think of something from low fidelity to high fidelity, you might think of like a sketch uh, or a paper prototype, then a first prototype that you implement in software or you know, mocking things up to finally a high fidelity prototype, uh, which looks very similar uh, to the final system. And you can do this with other interactive systems, including, including robots and haptics. I'm going to draw from my time at UBC. This is the Cuddlebot. It is a robot at uh, UBC that's a therapeutic social robot. It breathes, it moves its head, it purrs. And it's a very expensive device to work with. It's very difficult to iterate with a full robot. So uh, my colleagues at UBC, while I was there, um, decided to try using Cuddle Bits. These are these small open source uh, open hardware little devices um, that allow you to really rapidly explore from low fidelity to about medium fidelity prototypes. So they start by playing around with paper. And I advise you to do this, just play around with materials, grab anything that's handy, go to a hardware store um, and play around with you know, motion, how things might work. Then you start to get a little bit medium fidelity. You incorporate things like servos, you incorporate some, uh, you know, some coding to actually make it interactive. And you start to you know, evolve the most promising ideas and you iterate back to the materials. Eventually it becomes something that takes a little bit longer to create, but is closer to what you want. So you've gotten all the bad ideas out of the way and you're arriving at something that looks pretty good. In this case, this little like rib bot. Here's another example uh, of a different cuddle bit called the flexi bit. So here you're just playing around with some zip ties to get a sense of motion. And then you start to get to paper, you get to more elaborate uh, mechanisms for creating this motion. We add servos in, we iterate on the materials a little bit, and eventually you throw some uh, fur on it, you have a little triple creature, which is coming in just a second. So this is the flexi bit, and now you've got these furry little creature, creature, critters that can actually express emotion. And you're able to iterate on the order of minutes, hours, maybe days to create with this. Um, and what's really cool about this is that this is an open hardware system. You can go right now uh, to the UPC website to find out, to you know, download these templates and create your own. Uh, a lot of this draws inspiration from Camille Massette's work uh, on haptic sketching. And so you can take this inspiration for everyday objects and materials. Here is a project that uh, Camille worked on with a collapsing giraffe. And he tried to recreate this through um, uh, through rapid prototyping. So you take, uh, you know, you laser cut some, some mechanisms, you put them together in a, attach it to an Arduino and uh, you kind of rattle it around and then it becomes stiff. And so you've got this, these two modes of where it's collapsed and then where it's, you know, the tension is, is in the system and it, it stays tight and maintains its state, uh, state. And you see, you're just screwing things together. You're cutting out simple shapes, you're aligning it together and you get this medium fidelity prototype fairly quickly on the order of minutes or hours. And so I really encourage you to do this prototyping. Um, yeah, I can keep talk, talking a little bit. So that's how you do this initial prototype of low fidelity to medium fidelity prototyping. You just try and everything out as cheaply and quickly as possible. And then you start to refine your ideas once you come up with something more elaborate. Coming back to this example of um, this macaron study, this, this tool where we were studying the design process using this editor, once people had their initial design, they started to iterate, right? It's very important to iterate in your design process. So they took their initial design and then they created a heartbeat from it. So you can see here, there's lots of scrubbing around, there's kind of playing around with the, the timing of the heart. And then they start to align it. Um, they start to move things around. This is obviously sped up a little bit. Uh, they create the first heartbeat and then they're gonna replicate it in a second. There we go. So you've got your initial design. And then you start to refine. So they did the same thing in frequency. So now you're editing um, just these tiny little things. So now they're making tiny little adjustments and they're playing the entire thing. So if you can imagine if you're painting, you might spend some time in detail kind of, you know, uh, painting the, 
the canvas and then you step back to take a look at the whole thing and make tiny little adjustments. And so you might want to think about when you want to do this because um, they can help you do these big broad design explorations through haptic sketching and these tiny refinements once you have you know, a more uh, refined built prototype. And real-time feedback is really important. So having that ability to kind of like feel things. So as you're doing this, build your infrastructure to make sure you can feel things as you're making them. So that's prototyping. It's important to rapidly produce lots of ideas and then develop the most promising ideas. I'm gonna talk about evaluation. I'm gonna try and do this relatively quickly because I think we're running up to the time limit. When evaluating a system, you wanna link it back to your original goals. So everything I said at the beginning about establishing requirements, that feeds into your evaluation. And hopefully it, you know, what your goals are guide your design process with then, which is then what you wanna evaluate. For general UX, there's a couple of common questionnaires, the user experience questionnaires and attractive for ones that are used. And in VR settings, you might also consider the presence questionnaire, uh, which is commonly used to see how, uh, how much presence there is in your system. These tools have been used to uh, measure improved user experience metrics when adding tactile feedback to movies or to increase presence when using passive haptics and, or props in VR, as well as I think active haptics now. So there, you, know, you can use these tools to evaluate your system to see if it has general UX. I'd also like to you know, plug this HX model because you might have different goals. You may be interested in realism immersion, which is part of experience, but you may be building something that isn't meant to be realistic or isn't meant to be immersive. And so you may wanna think about either these constructs or others that you've come up with um, and linking back to them. And we're currently looking to how you might do this, how you might measure or capture this, um, which I'm hoping, hopefully can talk about more later. So how do we evaluate our systems? I'm gonna show you a quick example of how you do this informally and how you might do this uh, formally, especially uh, in a remote research setting. So for the first one you might uh, do is just kind of get rapid feedback from other people. This is a project I did uh, early on in my PhD. Uh, it's about sketching vibration. And I built a little tablet that lets you play around with vibration, super simple. Uh, what you do is you just kind of sketch on this big canvas. Um, you can change frequency. It can change amplitude. You can change waveform. And you can change the uh, envelope about you know, how much it fades in and out to really shape how you create the system. And you can also you know, record and replay. When I brought this to hapticians, um, I had it so that I was on the right holding the system, so holding one actuator, and the uh, haptician was editing it and holding the, the, another actuator. And we felt the exact same output. So it was a what you feel is what I feel system, which means that they could kind of play around and talk about what they're saying. And I had that shared context about what they were creating, which meant that we had really easy informal communication. I had them try and create emotional sensations. So something that was happy, angry, sad. And at one point they sketched something that I hadn't asked in the sketch and said, can you guess what I just did? And I paused and I thought, okay. And then I said, it's a sleepy sensation. And the haptician said, yeah. So in that moment, the haptician tried something out rapidly. I was able to informally judge what they had said and give feedback. And they knew that, okay, at least two people think this is a sleepy sensation. So this is a design candidate for later. So having this kind of informal communication and having people feel the same thing uh, is one way of getting feedback early on in your design process. So this is really good for exploration and communication. Uh, I wanna leave you with another project that is really important right now. And my lab's been leveraging this uh, findings from this quite a bit. Often when you're doing a haptic study, you bring people into the lab to experience the sensation because uh, you have a, a custom prototype. And what we were interested in doing is how do you get from doing you know, small in-lab studies to crowdsourcing it? How do you deploy haptics uh, at scale over uh, remotely? And the question we asked was, okay, well, if we can't send high fidelity haptics, what can we send? And we thought about it, you know, there's these other things we could send, graphics, we can make your phone vibrate, you can send audio, you can send proxies. And this solution is uh, what we call HapTurk. It involved a, a high fidelity vibration, something for like a wearable. You end up creating visualizations and these low fidelity vibrations with your phone, deploy it over something like Mechanical Turk, and then you get informed design. 
What we found from doing this is that these proxies do actually yield similar results to what you might run in an in-lab study. There are some successful proxies and guidelines for improvement. Uh, so, you know, it, it worked in some ratings. We have people rate, um, you know, whether they had, they felt the right energy, whether it felt good. And there were no major breakdowns when deploying remotely. What we deployed remotely matched what we got in the lab for a similar study. So there is some evidence that you can do these remote studies with haptics. So I invite you to check that out. So with evaluation, you wanna make sure you relate back to your goals and collect rapid feedback through both informal and formal feedback as needed. So this is the picture I've been building to this whole talk. If you wanna take a screenshot, I recommend you screenshot this slide. This is the takeaway from this talk. I'll wait a second. So what I do, what I'd like to do is invite you when you next design a haptic system, think back to this presentation and about using these steps to create great haptic experience. Um, this wasn't done in a vacuum. These are some of my colleagues and of course, some of the, the institutes that supported me. Um, for my work, obviously I reference other work here. Thank you so much. I think I finished the nick of time.